Hello, New Hope family, and welcome to New Hope Online. It's great having you join us. Today, Pastor Kerry is continuing his Love Letters from God series by looking at what John said in 3 John, and it's titled, Showing It. <laughs> Before he does, though, I want to plug that Grief Share starts on September 7th. It's a great program. There's also a golf outing woohoo, on September 11th. Don't miss it. Conquer Min Series has an informational meeting on September 13th. Uh, there's also a marriage seminar going on throughout the weekend of September 11th through the 13th. There's a couple different signups depending on which days you want to be involved. And also Seraph sign up for kids who want to sing and perform is on September 19th. Uh, if you want to sign up for any of these, you can using our, our, our app uh, or on the website. And finally, Denny Beckman has put his name forward as an elder, uh, so feel free to write our elders with encouragement and thoughts. With that, here's Gary. Welcome to our online service here at New Hope Christian Church this Labor Day weekend, September 5th. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 3rd John. That's right, the uh, 3rd John, it's the uh, towards the end of the Bible, and we're wrapping up our sermon series uh, this weekend. Uh, entitled um, Love Letters from God. Game shows on television not only uh, give contestants the opportunity to go home with prizes, good prizes, maybe even cash, but they also allow those who are watching at home to participate by guessing the answers along with the in-studio contestants. So, my question for you, and probably this is something only uh, the older saints uh, that are watching, more mature Christians, will be able to answer. Here it is. What current game show first began in 1963 with Monty Hall as its host? You know what? I'm not even going to give you the, the name of it. Um, yes, I am, because <laughs> it's in my next paragraph. Each has each episode of Let's Make a Deal uh, concludes a person who participated in that day's episode and won some prizes, given the opportunity to trade their prize in and perhaps get something even bigger. And it's called uh, The Big Deal. Now, in The Big Deal, there are three doors and behind each of them is a prize. Behind one is a huge prize. Behind another is a prize that is kind of comparable and worth to what they had already won. And then the third door has a zonk, a prize that is of little or no value at all. We conclude today our sermon series on the New Testament letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John entitled Love Letters from God. All three of them are written by one of Jesus' apostles, the apostle named John. Our text today is 3rd John. Interestingly enough, it is the absolute shortest letter or book in the entire New Testament. In this letter, John alludes to three men, two of whom were walking in love and truth and obedience to God and one who wasn't. Now the reality is all of us have role models. All of us have people whom we look up to and admire. I'd like for you today at the conclusion of this to choose which of these uh, three men uh, you would most like to imitate in your life. Now, while in Let's Make a Deal, contestants don't know what is behind the curtain they are choosing, you're going to know enough about each of these three men to decide whom you would like to be. So, uh, let's look at person number one, and I'm going to read from verses one through eight. This letter is from John the Elder. I am writing to Gaius, my dear friend whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you are living according to the truth. I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. 
Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for these traveling teachers who pass through even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. So person number one described here in verses one through eight is a man named Gaius, who is a great example of godly hospitality. One of the areas the early church was exceptional at was in their fellowship, their hospitality with one another. Acts 2 verse 46 tells us every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. Now, I don't know how long they continued taking turns hosting potluck every day in their homes, but these first century Christians thoroughly enjoyed one another. They connected with each other as they gathered together, as they shared their life stories in their homes, as they shared laughter in their homes. And as a result, the Bible tells us in Acts 2 and verse 47, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved every day. And I guarantee you, the fellowship, the camaraderie, the unity they had was a huge part of that. One of the life lessons many learned during our hibernation in our homes due to COVID is that we really do need each other. And as wonderful as it has been to gather together again in, in the, the church building with the family of God, Fellowship in a church building with a few hundred people is not nearly as intimate as fellowship in a home with six to 12 people. John was writing to the church at Ephesus. Gaius was a close friend of John's. He may have been an actual leader in the church or he may have had a substantial influence in the church. You know, there are times when I meet someone and, and uh, they find out who I am and where I work and they'll ask me this question. Oh, is so-and-so a member of your congregation? Generally, I find it a good idea to follow up their question with a question. If so-and-so were a member of our congregation, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Or if the individual already knows that their acquaintance is a part of New Hope Christian Church, they will say, well, I know one of your members very well. And in that case, uh, I, I hope they have a positive viewpoint of that individual. John says here that Gaius has a great reputation uh, amongst all those who come in contact with him. And John says he's very proud of Gaius, that, that Thinking of Gaius makes him, brings him joy. Whenever someone brought up the name of Gaius to John, they always did so in a positive way. Jesus told us in his Sermon on the Mount that we need to both hear the word of God, know the word of God, and obey the word of God. Obviously, Gaius read the word of God meditated on the Word of God, digested the Word of God, delighted in the Word of God, and practiced the Word of God in his daily life. And friends, when we regularly expose ourselves to the truths of God's Word, the Holy Spirit empowers us to live that truth, and our lives then give testimony to the power of God, even as did the life of Gaius. As the last living apostle of Jesus Christ, entrusted with the truth of God, John needed to maximize his influence and effectiveness in the churches he oversaw. So John would send out teachers to these various churches 
whom he had personally trained in the truths of Jesus Christ, just as Jesus had commanded he and the other disciples to do. These individuals, these traveling teachers, would be dependent upon the hospitality of the people in the churches where they taught for housing and for food. Time and time again, Gaius could be counted upon to house and feed the many teachers sent by John to the church in Ephesus. Martin Luther, along with his wife, Kate, were legendary for their open door hospitality. Alexander Strauch worked, wrote in his book entitled The Hospitality Commands, and I'm quoting now from that book. Martin Luther proved that the table is a splendid pulpit from which to teach God's truths and disciple God's people. Your home is the best tool you have to enhance loving Christian community. Your local church can become a friendlier, more loving community if you, and others you know, consistently open your homes to one another. Now, I, I know from personal experience that hosting others in the home can be a lot of work. Gene and I kind of have a system. Uh, I, I try to do most of the house cleaning. She does most all of the cooking. We both kind of do some inviting and the system seems to work together. I suspect that if on any given week, there were only 10 New Hope families or couples or single adults hosting gathering in their homes every, every week, not, not the same ones, but just 10 from amongst the congregation, we would see a tremendous uptick in the closeness and the unity of our fellowship, as well as an increase in the number of people coming to the Lord. Hospitality in the Jewish culture uniquely set them apart from other cultures of that day. Familiar with the Jewish custom, Jesus sent his disciples out on mission trips more than once, encouraging them to find food and lodging in the homes of those whom they taught. In fact, Jesus went so far as to say that when we show hospitality to others, we are actually welcoming and hosting him. For whatever you do to the least of these, you're doing to me, Jesus said. The apostle Peter wrote, cheerfully share your home with those in need who need a meal or a place to stay. Paul added, always be eager to practice hospitality. And the author of Hebrews reminds us, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some in doing this have entertained angels without realizing it. When a guest at a Marriott hotel found out that her sister had died, she expressed her grief to a hotel employee named Charles. Charles was touched by her grief and so he uh, purchased a sympathy card, circulated it amongst the hotel staff, had them sign it, and then gave her the card along with a piece of apple pie. She later wrote to the president of the hotel chain a note that read, and, and I quote, Mr. Marriott, <clears throat> I will never meet you, and it's not necessary that I do, but I did meet Charles, one of your employees. And because of Charles, I know what you stand for. And I want you to know that as long as I live, <clears throat> I will stay at your hotels. Christian hospitality is more than just having people over for a meal, more than just <clears throat> having people over for dessert and, and some games. Christian hospitality is demonstrating in human flesh the reality of God's unconditional, overpowering love. Gaius understood that. Gaius had developed a re reputation for being a loving and godly individual because of the warm and welcoming way he invited and hosted people in his home. 
What about us? When was the last time we hosted others in our home? What if all of us committed to hosting people in our homes, even once a month or every other month? What if we did this uh, on a regular basis, hosting both those we already know as well as those we would like to get to know? And if we're not doing that, what's preventing us from being like Gaius. Let's go to verses nine through 11. <clears throat> I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children, while those who do evil prove that they do not know God. So person number two that John introduces us to is an individual named Diotrephes. Now Diotrephes was an ungodly leader with prideful arrogance. When under the control and authority of God and imitating the life and the person of Jesus Christ, people can sometimes be like angels, can't they? On the other hand, when not under the authority and the control of God and looking out primarily for their own position and their own possessions and their own power, people can sometimes be like demons. There was in the church at Ephesus a man named Diotrephes. We're not told if he was an elder in the church or if he was in some other position of leadership, but he definitely uh, was an integral main part of that church. Now, Diotrephes had an overinflated ego that need to be in control. He arrogantly thought that what he believed the congregation to knew, needed to do was best for everybody. He didn't seem to be all that concerned about bringing glory to the Lord. He didn't seem to be that concerned about what was best for the entire congregation at Ephesus. Some Bible scholars have speculated that Diotrephes might have agreed with the false teachings concerning the identity of Christ that we've looked at in previous sermons. And that's why John sent these truth teachers to set Diotrephes straight. Maybe Diotrephes assumed he was in charge of the flock there at Ephesus and he felt threatened by John's oversight and John's influence. Regardless of the reason, John tells us he had previously written a letter to the church about this situation, and apparently Diotrephes had intercepted that letter. Not only did Diotrephes refuse to help the teaching teachers who had been sent from John with financial help or a place to stay, but he forbid others from doing so in the church. Worse yet, Diotrephes expelled those out of the church who were demonstrating hospitality. Man, it's incredible to me to think that any leader would elevate himself above an apostle of Jesus Christ, but Diotrephes did. I mean, if we think about it, there's usually a Diotrephes in every congregation and even many other secular organizations. And these people imagine themselves as being divinely selected to make sure everybody else follows the rules as they interpret it and knows who is boss. These people are so full of themselves, they are blind to the reality of what they are doing. King Louis XIV was one of France's greatest kings, known as the Sun King for the brilliance of his wisdom. His armies made France the most powerful country of its time. But when the English defeated the French 
in August of 1704 in the Battle of Blenheim, it destroyed this myth that France was invincible. And King Louis XIV was reported to have said, how could God do this to me? After all I've done for him. King Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible was kind of like King Louis XIV. He once was taking pride, great pride in himself and the, the kingdom that he had acquired and built. And as a result of his pride, God punished him by removing Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom from him and reducing him to eating the same grass cows ate for nourishment. Now, you would think that would humble a person right away. You would think that an individual would see how ridiculously arrogant their pride has been. But no, it took Nebuchadnezzar seven long years before he finally humbled himself and thanked God for all that God had given the king. And we think maybe those are kind of extreme examples. I would never do that. I would never be that proud or that arrogant. I wonder, have we ever questioned God when life doesn't seem fair to us? Have we ever reminded God that we read the Bible, we attend worship, we even give to him when he hasn't answered our prayers the way we thought he should? Pride and arrogance can take many forms, most of which the proud and the arrogant can't see. Henry Ward Beecher was an American preacher who supported the abolition of slavery. He once said, and I quote, a proud man is seldom a grateful man, for he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. Jesus said, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Here is a sad reality. Most of the distractions, disassociations, and divisions that take place in the church of Jesus Christ are more about personality differences than they are doctrinal differences. People like Diotrephes will always think they know what's best for Christ's church, even if what they propose is opposed to Christ's teachings. Paul's advice to the church in Rome is still a good advice for us today. Watch out, he wrote, for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to the truth. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord, but they are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent and trusting people. Believe me, those are not the kind of people we want to admire or imitate or follow or even be associated with. All right, I'm gonna kind of backtrack here for person number three and, and read from verses 11 and 12. Dear friend, don't let this bad example of diatrophies influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children and those who do evil prove that they don't know God. For instance, everyone speaks highly of Demetrius as does the truth itself. We ourselves can say the same for him and you know we speak the truth. Person number three that John brings up is a man named Demetrius, a man who was a, had a godly reputation of quiet faithfulness. St. Augustine was an early Christian theologian and writer who once said, and I quote, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. John contrasts the arrogant pride of Diotrephes with the quiet faithfulness of Demetrius. There's very little said about Demetrius. 
I suspect that's probably the way that Demetrius would have preferred it. He's probably the one John entrusted to deliver this letter to the church at Ephesus because John trusted. He trusted Demetrius to get the letter there and to make sure the church received it before Diotrephes did. In the 1990 movie, Home Alone, Macaulay Culkin is an eight-year-old boy named Kevin. His family accidentally left Kevin at home alone in Chicago over the Christmas break when they took a holiday vacation to Paris. Do you remember the scene when uh, Kevin runs screaming through his empty house, hands pressed against the sides of his face? That seems to be the way many people today, including Christians, are reacting to the moral, political, economic, religious chaos of our day. But in Psalm chapter 2, David says, while the world rages and shouts and schemes against God, he laughs and scoffs at them. God doesn't get worked up over the absurdities and the chaos, the hatred of this world, because God knows who is in control. The uh, Thessalonian church of the first century was facing a situation much like ours today. They lived during a time of political unrest. Christians were unusually, unfairly being scrutinized and criticized. Manual labor was seen by the Romans as lowly, undignified work, not, not unlike many see it in America today. Well, rather than encouraging the church to engage in public argument with the world or try to change the culture through political activism or even speculate about the end times, Paul calls them away from the controversies of this world when he writes, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, working with your hands. Then you will not need to depend on others and unbelievers will respect the way you live. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul called the believers in Thessalonica to combat the chaos, the unrest of their day by quietly living faithful lives for Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. There are other scriptures that tell us to be salt and light in the dark times we live, to make sure that we have godly leaders who rule us instead of ungodly leaders, to pray for our government leaders, to live as though we expect these to be our last days on earth. But having said that, Paul tells us don't get so worked up that you forget God laughs at those who mock him. God's got everything under control. God's got everyone under control. So. Keep living quiet, faithful lives and believing in him. Elton Trueblood was a Christian author and theologian who was friends with five United States presidents. He once said, and I quote, faith is not belief without proof. Faith is trust without reservations. Jesus said, Whoever can be trusted with the little things can also be trusted with greater things. Obviously, Demetrius had proven himself to John faithful in smaller things so that when John was ready to have this letter delivered, it was Demetrius he entrusted with that task. Demetrius was just fine with quietly being faithful, staying out of the limelight. Believers like Demetrius are compared by Jesus to a mustard seed. A mustard seed may be small, but eventually it grows into a large tree. And likewise, 
God can take the quiet faithfulness of a believer and accomplish great things through that individual. Joseph and Clara Gant were married in 1948. Not long after that, Joseph was deployed with the United States Army to fight in the Korean War. Sergeant Gant was captured, thought to be killed in action in 1950. For decades, his body was never found. His death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. And yet, during those decades, Gant's wife, Clara, uh, continued to look for him to come back. She regularly met with government in officials seeking information about what had happened. Clara bought a house, professionally had it landscaped, so that when Joseph returned, all he'd have to do is go fishing. Now that's the kind of life, right? <laughs> Clara was 94 years old when her husband's remains were finally brought home for a military funeral with full honors. Wasn't the homecoming Clara had hoped for, but she finally knew what happened to her husband. Clara told a reporter who did an interview with her afterwards, and I quote, my husband told me that if anything happened to him, he wanted me to remarry. I told him, no, I'm still his wife and I will remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. Until that day Jesus calls us home, he expects us to faithfully follow him whatever happens in our lives, however the world may be raging around us. It's not we who need to build a home for Jesus other than in our heart, but rather it is Jesus who is building a home for us in heaven. And while Mrs. Gant's wait ended with sorrow and disappointment, the faithfulness of every believer in Jesus will be rewarded with eternal jubilation. So what kind of person do we want to be until that time our Lord calls us home? How would we like to be known by other people? Like Gaius, person number one, who is a great example of godly hospitality? Or like Diotrephes, person number two, who was an ungodly leader with prideful arrogance? Or like Demetrius, person number three, who had a godly reputation of quiet faithfulness. Personally, I'd like to be a combination of number one and two, Gaius and Demetrius. I'd like to be a man others would look at who had a quiet faithfulness and practiced godly hospitality. You see, my friends, when we live like Gaius and when we live like Demetrius, we are going to have a profound and lasting impact on others that oftentimes we're not even aware of. If you've never committed your life to following Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Messiah, sent from heaven to forgive and free us from our sins, this is the day and the time to do so. Stop procrastinating. Give us a call at New Hope Christian Church or call one of your friends you know has that walk and relationship with the Lord and find out how you can get started on your journey to everlasting life. Let's pray. Our eternal Father in heaven, uh, we are blessed by the truth of your word, by examples uh, godly examples of those who follow it, who live your truth, and, and God, even ungodly examples of those who do not live uh, your truth. Because Lord, we then have a clear picture of what it is we would like to be. I pray that this series through first and second and third John uh, has caused us to be a, a better loving people, individuals who Seek to know your truth so that we can obey your truth. I pray, Father, that you would use our uh, congregation, our family at New Hope, the individuals who worship here. God, raise up quiet, godly people of hospitality 
who, like a mustard seed, quietly, effectively have an impact on others for you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we look forward to sharing eternity with you and bringing as many people with us as possible. And we pray these things in the name of your Son and for his sake and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here online at New Hope Christian Church. And now it is our opportunity, our privilege to go out and be the church wherever God places us to do life.